Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Statech Research's seminar series on measuring progress and well-being. I'm Kelsey O'Connor, one of the organizers. Today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Christian Kreckel, who will discuss using well-being data to make better policy decisions. Before getting started, I'd like to share a little information about our annual workshop, which will be from the 6th to the 7th of June. Uh, we have a few more spots open if you're interested in attending. And uh, if so, registration will close on the 24th of May, so uh, just over a week. You'll want to uh, take a look at our website uh, to, to find the registration link. Uh, back to today, Chris will speak for around 40 minutes and then address questions at the end. At that time, please raise your virtual hands or post your questions in the chat. During the presentation, please keep your microphones muted. And a last reminder, we are recording the event. You'll be able to find this and past recordings on our website and YouTube channel. Now let me introduce Dr. Christian Kreckel. Chris is an assistant professor in behavioral science in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science at the London School of Economics. He is also a research associate at the Center for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics and at the Wellbeing Research Center, at University of Oxford. And he obtained his PhD from Paris School of Economics. Chris's research looks at how our environment affects our lives, specifically our behavior, health, and ultimately our well being. He is also interested in using nudges to increase pro environmental behavior. Uh, most relevant for today, Chris's work aims to improve evidence based policy for improving these outcomes um, and doing so in a cost effective manner. Um, and indeed, he is a frequent advisor uh, to national governments and international organizations, such as the World Bank um, or the OECD on related matters. Uh, for his work, Chris has been awarded the Young Economist Award by the European Economic Association. Um, and if you heard me before, I am really truly looking forward to, to reading his book and uh, this presentation. Uh, without further ado, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Christian Kreckel. Chris, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be uh, presenting in the seminar. So the title of my talk is uh, What it's Really Worth, Using Wellbeing Data in Wealth Analysis to Make Better Policy Decisions. And it's sort of like a, an all-round talk which captures on, well, touches on some aspects uh, of our book, but also on sort of like ongoing work and tries to provide an all-around um, overview of the field on how to use wellbeing data for uh, making policy decisions. There's a bit of a a bias towards the UK because that's where I'm working. And so some of the numbers I'm providing, they're sort of pretty much UK based, but much of the basic ideas and the basic methodologies can be applied also in different uh, other uh, contexts. Okay, so um, I'm starting with a quote and it goes back to Jeremy Bentham here in 1830. And he said, create all the happiness you're able to create, remove all the misery you're able to remove. And this sounds like a very um, sort of maybe superficial and sort of, you know, broad um, quote, but however, this is actually really possible in the sense that we do have now, and Jeremy Bentham did not have those tools, but we do now have the tools to actually put this into practice. And I hope that my talk can sort of provide you with an overview on how to do this uh, and potentially also in your own uh, work. Um, so let me start with the motivation. So cost-benefit analysis, as you probably know, is the um, workhorse of most governments for welfare analysis, be it for either traditional policies or behavioral public policies. And conventional, traditional cost-benefit analysis measures benefits, individual benefits of policies uh, in terms of <clears throat> willingness to pay, which usually is either stated, so I can simply ask you how much you would be willing to pay for a certain policy, certain benefit you obtain from a policy, or it can be revealed willingness to pay. So that's usually what economists are using because they don't really trust stated willingness to pay. So they don't really trust people, you know, stated preferences. So they look at their revealed preferences, their direct uh, behavior, and basically obtain uh, a willingness to pay from that. So for example, if you look at transport policies, if you, you know, you build a, you basically observe people paying more for like a toll, of a faster road that sort of like reveals their, you know, their preferences for, you know, uh, having a faster road being built in monetary terms. So it's usually the, the kind of ways on how to, you know, measure individual benefits of policies. But of course, you know, looking at willingness to pay might be problematic. First of all, when it comes to stated preferences, people might not be 
particularly good at putting a price tag onto things. You know, there might be in many cases a hypotheticality uh, element of it. Many you know, choice situations are quite hypothetical. There might be cognitive biases. We might not always predict the welfare consequences of our choices uh, ex ante perfectly well um, because of, you know, for example, immune neglect. We might, you know, avoid or might not really estimate that we get adapted or used to certain things. There might be demand effects, so I might simply answer in particular ways that you know you want me to answer, and so on and so forth. So stated preferences are not really favored so much. As I said, revealed preferences economists like much more. Um, but here too are problems, right? I mean, markets might not be perfectly functioning. There might not be that fast a road with um, with uh, you know a toll available, or I might not be knowing about about it. Um, so there are also problems for many things that we actually value quite a lot um, in our personal domains, our personal life, our health, uh, social relationships, the environment, climate, you know, these are things which are very, where markets do not really exist and do not, um, or if they exist, do not perfectly function. So we propose in our uh, line of research, an alternative to this, we propose to measure individual benefits, not in terms of willingness to pay, either stated or revealed, but in terms of people's self-reported well-being, in particular, we want to look at their self-reported uh, life satisfaction. So sometimes we actually call this experience preferences to make this sort of distinct from state of preferences and revealed preferences, because people you know, have made their choices, they go through their lives, they experience a certain condition in life, and hence they experience a certain better or higher life satisfaction or not. Um, so that's our proposal. And the measure we are proposing particularly are well-beings or well-being years. That's our measure of individual benefit, simply defined as one point of life satisfaction on a zero to 10 Likert scale for one person for one year. And you can see this here very clearly. So this simple Likert scale, which I took from the German socioeconomic panel study, where people are asked, okay, um, please answer according to the following scale. Zero means completely dissatisfied, 10 means completely satisfied. How satisfied are you with your life, all things considered? And then you basically put yourself down on where you stand currently uh, or where you think you stand, stand currently in your life and then a way is essentially a one point uh, increase say from five to six or from three to four or from uh, seven uh, to eight um, Wellbeings are quite a flexible uh, measure of individual benefits. So usually when we when we use them for policy analysis we use them in sort of like a utilitarian sense so we basically add up wellbeings for different people in a similar way giving them equal wage without sort of like giving more priority to say the least, the less well off. But wave is also flexible to work with other social welfare functions besides the utilitarian social welfare function. So for example, uh, prioritarian social welfare functions where you first transform well-beings and then basically in a way that you give more wage to uh, the well-being, initial well-being of people at the lower end. Um, and of course, you know, we're currently working particularly on uh, using actually experiences of happiness as a complement to well-beings, um, because well-beings might sometimes be not not fine enough to capture sort of like short-term one-off activities like going to the park or you know going to the museum. And here we basically use experiences. But our broad measure, which we're suggesting for like major policies, is using well-beings or well-being years. Um, well-being years they also have a value, and we can put a monetary value onto them. And in the UK, particularly, we value one uh, WELBY, so one point increase on the zero to 10 scale uh, at uh, approximately 13,000 uh, pounds, which is in 2019 uh, prices. And you might ask yourself, okay, how, do, how the hell did you get to this value? And I can actually provide you with a calculation. So first of all, it's a midpoint of a, of a whole range of values. So essentially, we basically have a range of one WELBY between, one WELBY between 10,000 pounds as a sort of lower bound and 16,000 pounds as an upper bound. And then basically in UK policy making, they simply argued, okay, well, let's take the midpoint here, which is 13,000. And for sensitivity analysis of policy appraisals, we can basically look at between 10,000 and 16,000. So as I said, this is all in 2019 prices. We can adapt this, you know, basically inflation adjusted to today. So in 2022 prices, the midpoint would actually be 14,127 pounds. And if you want to put this, I think in 2023 prices, I think it would be something like 15,000 pounds. So there's a formula as well to like adapt this to the current price level. So the, the lower bound here actually comes from our book. And what we did is we essentially used the monetary value of a quality adjusted life year, which is currently valued in the UK 
at around 70,000 pounds, we used this as sort of like the benchmark. And then we looked at the annual population survey and we looked at okay, what is full health associated with. So quality is one year and perfect mental and, and physical health. We looked at what does this, you know, what does full health actually correspond to in terms of life satisfaction points. And most people who are in full health, they value their, or they basically state that, you know, their life satisfaction level is on average eight. Um, uh, we also know that people who are sort of like at the, at sort of like suicidal ideation uh, are at a lower life satisfaction level, most much lower. It's not zero, it's around one. So we essentially took one way be valued at 70,000 uh, divided by eight minus one, which is around 10,000. And that's sort of where the lower end uh, of the, or the lower monetary value of the way be essentially comes from. So we're essentially pegging it onto something which UK government is already using and not only UK government, I think there are many other governments that sort of use qualies as an established measure for health uh, valuation. We're essentially pegging it onto that and hence, you know, making it consistent with the existing apparatus of, of uh, policy appraisal and government. The upper end, 16,000 actually comes from the margin rate of substitution, which is derived from a very high income coefficient of 1.96. And that gives you at an average earnings in the UK of 13,000 pounds, an upper bound of around 16,000 pounds. So these were the bounds which were empirically provided. And in the UK, at least one has decided to go with a midpoint as a compromise value, which is 13,000 pounds. So the good thing about the value of the value generally is that it's actually quite simple to use, right? I mean, if you want to monetize the impacts on life satisfaction of any policy or intervention, it's very, very easy. Here's a very simple example. If you have an effect of an intervention X on life satisfaction that provides 0.15 points per individual per year, you can simply monetizing this by, you know, taking this 0.15 points and multiplying this with the monetary value of a YLB, which is 13,000 pounds. And you get like a, you get a value of this intervention of 1,950 pounds per individual uh, per year. So one of the good things about the value of the, about the YLB is simply that it's so easy to use. Right. I mean, we do have like one sort of common uh, monetary value, which is being used and which can be updated. And then we can look at coefficients of life satisfaction, which can come from either our own interventions or from, from the literature. And we can simply monetize them without so much adjustment um, um, for at the individual level and an annual level. Um, why do we look at life satisfaction particularly? I just like, want to make this case again, because uh, one might also argue, why don't we look at worthwhileness or why don't we look at sort of experiences of happiness? Um, well, we primarily want to look at self-reported life satisfaction of individuals for various reasons, where there are sound psychometric properties, and I'm not going too much into detail in this talk here because I'm focusing mostly on policy, but you know, there are, of course, psychologists and partly some economists, of course, working on sort of validating uh, life satisfaction in terms of psychometrics. Um, but besides that, there are a couple of conceptual reasons why life satisfaction is a good measure for us. Um, some people might argue, and many people might argue that it's actually a democratic measure. So it can be seen as a vote on one's life, right? I mean, this basically, you know, allows the individual to assess for himself or herself what, you know, how life is going for that individual rather than sort of like, yep. you know, taking this from sort of like the revealed behavior of the individual without asking can be seen as a key life outcome. Um, so basically there are lots of a uh, couple of behavioral experiments and discrete choice experiments that look at, okay, when people are getting different vignettes of different lives, they might want to lead uh, uh, what kind of like life outcomes do they choose? And basically they choose in many situations on most situations, um, life satisfaction or a life that scores high in life satisfaction is the main outcome. It correlates well with objective outcomes like long longevity, um, many other things as well. It predicts individual behavior and voting behavior, which is a good argument for particular policymakers to look at uh, life satisfaction. So here's one study by George Ward, who was in Oxford and who looked at, um, um, at life satisfaction as one predictor for voting for the incumbent government. And who finds that, uh, I think, looking at various elections since the 1970s at the in Europe, who finds that sort of national happiness is a stronger predictor for voting for the incumbent government than the GDP growth rate or the unemployment rate or the inflation rate. So for a policymaker, a policymaker should kind of be interested uh, himself or herself in, you know, using, uh, you know, nat using national life satisfaction or life satisfaction as a important measure for uh, policy appraisal and evaluation. What I like as a behavioral scientist 
a lot about uh, about life satisfaction is that it sort of I always say it allows us to capture behavior scientific phenomena that are kind of like uniquely captured by well-being data. Things like anticipation and mispredictions, so people might anticipate certain policies and might also mispredict uh, welfare consequences of policies. We can see that people adapt to certain changes in their life circumstances um, in life satisfaction data, and it might be quite important for policy appraisers. Some policies might actually have constant benefits to individuals, but to other policies, you know, people might adapt. And so it might be important to capture this adaptation also if we want to appraise policies, because policies might not provide benefits forever. Um, it might, life satisfaction data is also capturing relative comparisons or like blatantly said jealousy, right? I mean, I might be, a policy might affect me positively, but I might have negative consumption externalities uh, on you. And so it might be a zero sum effect of the policy in total. So this is, you know, usually not captured by more monetary willingness to pay. Also other household members of policies um, and also things like, you know, procedural utility of, of being treated fairly or with dignity. These are things which are usually not captured by traditional willingness to pay measures, but which might be equally important for uh, policy appraisal and evaluation. Because sometimes policies are, are um, you know, delivered in different ways and the way policies are delivered might also be affected might have an impact on how people feel about how they are uh, targeted by a policy. Um, and again, this is one of my favorite um, charts, which I'm always showing by Andrew Clark at all in 2008 in the Economic Journal, where they basically look at um, adaptation to different life events. And you can see here uh, life events, unemployment and marriage. And you can see here on the x-axis the years prior to the event and zero is the year when the event is happening. and then uh, you can see the years after the event, and then you can see the change in life satisfaction on a zero to, I think it is a zero to 10 scale. I think they use the German socioeconomic panel. And the same for marriage. You can see that, you know, there's a huge drop in life satisfaction around unemployment. And you can see that there's actually not much adaptation to being unemployed as people, you know, continue to be in the state, which, you know, makes, of course, a good, you know, case for active labor market policies that reduce unemployment because people don't get adapted to that. Marriage, on the other hand, um, you can see that there's a definitely a huge anticipation effect for marriage. People have also like a positive benefit in the year of marriage, but then, you know, as people, you know, are married and stay in this, in this, um, in this state of being married, you can see that actually people revert back to their baseline level and there's not a sort of like continuous benefit of being, uh, of being married. Um, so again, these are things which you know, seem to be trivial examples, at least in terms of marriage, but in terms of unemployment, you can see that you know, there are definitely policy implications in terms of the stream of benefits over time. People might get used to certain things and not to other things, and you might want to redirect policy attention to things where people are, don't, not, are not getting uh, adapted to. And finally, importantly, there is, of course, a, uh, a sort of like a practical argument on life satisfaction data. We do have a big evidence base already since the 1970s, thanks mostly to psychologists actually who put you know life satisfaction questions into, um, into national and international surveys. So it's cheap and easy to collect. It's usually like one question. Uh, it's easy to interpret and straightforward to analyze. And there exists already a large evidence base since the 1970s of you know what matters to people's lives and what doesn't. That's the case for the UK, but also that's the case for other countries. And there's currently huge efforts um, in several countries uh, to actually collect or create databases of life satisfaction coefficients. We call them social value, uh, social value bases or social value databases of what matters to people. So we have actually like go to life satisfaction coefficients that you know people can can take from these uh, databases. Um, so how do we use this now in practice? Um, so in the UK, at least, we have the Green Book. The Green Book is the official guidance for policy analysis of both policy appraisal ex ante as well as policy evaluation ex post. It's published by the Treasury in the UK and actually does allow now uh, to use policy analysis or to conduct policy analysis based on well-being data, which is particularly detailed in the supplementary guidance on well-being. Um, question is whether it's soon mandating it even. So the, the leader of the uh, Labour opposition, Keir Starmer um, of Labour in the UK, who are, have a good chance of actually you know, getting into government in the next couple of months, he has promised um, to have the Treasury man look at policy appraisals, not only in terms of 
willingness to pay, but also in terms of uh, well-being impacts. So maybe in the future, this is even going to be mandated. So it might be a huge step ahead in terms of uh, well-being policy analysis. But currently, we might we are allowed to use uh, well-being data uh, in terms of social cost benefit analysis and social cost effectiveness analysis in the UK. It's all detailed very much in the supplementary guidance on well-being to the Green Book. And this is based on uh, well-bees. So particularly well-bees are in there. And as you know, cost benefit and cost effectiveness analysis are actual decision-making tools, right? They're not only monitoring tools, we're not only monitoring how society is doing in terms of well-being and you know dashboards and various things, but we can actually make policy decisions uh, based on well-being data. So essentially spending decisions whether to go ahead with a policy or whether not to go ahead in a policy. And that's you know, are tools which are being used by central government and local government in the UK, but which are also imitated pretty much by sort of businesses, uh, charities, NGOs, and you know, they all decide then whether to make a case for a policy worth funding. Um, and we have the feeling, and it's, I think it's actually true that many countries are sort of like following this now. So New Zealand, essentially, they started off with wellbeing budgets, but they're also now using, starting to use wellbees. Australia is very interested in that. Denmark and Norway are using them uh, too, or starting to use them. Again, also developing social value bases and also using our methodology of sort of trying to pack the well-be onto existing measures of qualities being used by uh, the respective uh, governments. Now in social cost benefit analysis, essentially many of you might know this, what we're doing is we're trying to like choose the policy option that you know provides the highest social value. And the social value is defined as the benefits minus the costs. Right, so informally we select the policy option that gives the highest positive social uh, value. We want to write this out. Uh, it means that we basically take the policy or we choose the policy option that gives the highest positive net present social value. And the net present social value is the different difference between the net present value of the benefits and the net present value of the cost. And I can write out the net present value of the benefits as this term and the net present value of the costs as uh, this term. And essentially it's nothing less then the difference in the benefits for individual I at time period T uh, of having the intervention uh, uh, and not having the intervention. We sum this up over all individuals who are affected by the intervention or the policy and then over all time periods that this intervention is uh, being in effect. And we discount it back uh, to the present to have the net present uh, value. And essentially we do the same for the costs. The difference is that for the costs, we basically take into account individual costs and savings, right? So we look at the net individual uh, costs uh, to the indiv to the individual uh, in terms of sorry, the net public costs uh, at the individual level, um, which could be uh, sort of the direct costs of the intervention, but also sort of like further on costs of the of the intervention or policy, and also further on cost savings uh, of the policy or interventions. So for example, active like labor market policy might um, reduce benefit payments, which are cost savings to an individual, to the to the exchequer, individual cost savings to the exchequer, but might also reduce prime cost savings to the exchequer and so on and so forth. Again, we are basically calculating net present value of the co of the net public costs. And then we subtract both terms and we will get ideally a positive net present social value. And if this is the case, we basically want to implement uh, the policy. Often we also look at benefit cost ratios. So we're basically dividing the net present value of the benefits uh, by the net present value of the cost, and then we take the benefit cost ratio, which is high. Um, the thing to be seeing here is that, you know, this is, governments have been doing this all along, right? And they've been doing this all along by including here uh, willingness to pay estimates, uh, either stated or revealed. The thing is that we're now allowed to do in the UK, so we are allowed to use also here monetized well-being benefits. And we can basically list them in addition to the monetized benefits we have from stated, pref stated uh, willingness to pay and revealed uh, willingness uh, to pay. So essentially we can, if you want to put it that way, we can sort of enrich traditional or conventional cost benefit analysis with monetized uh, wellbees. And that's sort of like providing us with a more holistic picture of, of, um, of uh, the benefits of a policy. So we can include all the things that, you know, stated and revealed, pre revealed preferences or willingness to pay might not be able to capture. Um, that's sort of like the cost benefit analysis side. We can also do cost effectiveness analysis, which is in some ways the, 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 the way we uh, prefer because there we actually do not have to 
translate uh, Wavy's into monitor into monetary terms at all. We can simply use live satisfaction points or Wavy's without using the monetary value. And ideally, I mean, I, social cost, effect, cost effectiveness analysis actually works by calculating social unit costs. So we're essentially taking the costs and we're dividing them by the benefits and the benefits we don't have to calculate, we don't have to translate into uh, monetary terms. Again, if I want to write this out, we take the ideally the policy option, which is the lowest social unit costs. Again, we have the, um, the uh, net public costs at the individual level uh, of the intervention minus no intervention over all individuals affected, over all time periods affected, discounted back into the present. And here we have essentially the uh, well-being benefits just in terms of well-being, just in terms of life satisfaction points that accrue to the individual at each time period in case of the intervention minus less the intervention. Over all individuals, sum this over all individuals affected, over all time periods we want to look at uh, the intervention and we basically discount this back into the presence to have the net present value of the benefits. Essentially we calculate, we divide the net public costs by the net public uh, benefits of uh, the policy. And the only difference is that we here, here include wavies by themselves without you know, translating them into money. So without using the sort of times 13,000 uh, monetization uh, part of it. The only other difference is that um, we basically, if we have everything in terms of well-being terms, we use a slightly different discount rate here. So we use this discount rate rho, which is lower than the discount rate that we use for money. The idea here is that, you know, this well-being discount rate is pretty much equal to the health discount rate. And the idea is that, you know, so the social discount rate for money has a term in it which accounts for the fact that, you know, once we grow richer in the future, so our marginal utility of, you know, being richer, our marginal utility of money is, is sort of like, it's increasing at a decreasing rate. And so this is not the fact for well-being because, you know, our well-being in the future is as important in a sense in our well-being today. So essentially we have here a slightly lower discount rate. This is pretty much the same as we do it for health and health economics. So it's also 1.5, at least in the UK it is. And it's usually lower than the financial discount rate uh, always. That's the only other difference. And, you know, we prefer this way of going about things because we don't have to, you know, make assumptions about, you know, how much is one way we actually worth in monetary terms. So we don't even have to peg it onto the, onto the quality or use the margin rate of substitution or anything like it. We simply use life satisfaction points and get the social unit costs, which is essentially the amount of pounds that, you know, this policy, um, the amount of pounds that this policy costs to produce one way. And so we can compare the social unit cost to other sort of one policy to the social unit cost of other policies. And we use, we would always choose those policies which, or the policy that, you know, produces one way be at a cheaper cost. Now, okay, let's, let's look about, let's go a bit more into practice now to actually do this. First of all, um, as a social planner, if we want to maximize total values in society, uh, we want to, we want to maximize total values in society subject to like a budget constraint, right? I mean, that's of course the case only if we want to maximize uh, well-being in society, right? If happiness is our goal. Um, going back to this like quote by uh, Jeremy Bentham at the beginning who said, you know, create all the happiness you're able to create, remove all the misery you're able to remove. That actually is quite realistically doable these days, right? It's not like a utopian dream as it used to be in 1830, but it's actually a feasible reality. If we want to apply social cost effectiveness analysis, what we want to do is we want to essentially calculate the social unit costs of all the policies that are at our disposal. And what we're then doing is we're ranking all the policies from the sort of lowest social unit cost to the highest. And we want to implement, we would then implement all of these policies from the top to the bottom until sort of like our budget runs out. Um, and that is sort of like the way to maximize, you know, well-being in society. And this last policy, when the budget runs out, the social unit cost of that is actually then we can we can cap, we can basically say this is lambda, and lambda is um, the minimum social production cost of one way be in society, and it is ideally the value that sort of replaces this thirteen thousand uh, pounds value which we have shown at the beginning because that is sort of like derived as more like a compromise value from the margin rate of substitution and our pegging of the way be onto the quality. 
which again sort of is packed onto like an experiment actually, which was conducted in the 19, 1999, I think in the UK, and has never really been updated since then. So it's sort of like a little bit arbitrary, but if you want to like really get the value of, you know, the monetary value of one Welby, we would rank from the lowest social unit cost to the highest, implement until the budget runs out, and then we sort of look at the social unit cost of the last policy that we can implement, and that essentially gives us the, you know, the minimum social production cost of one Welby and the essentially the shadow price of one well-being in society. Now in our book, we sort of like, I mean, we didn't even try anything like this sort of like, you know, full government uh, perspective, but we looked at least at different uh, policies and we looked at, you know, the social unit costs of them. And we basically tried uh, to rank them from sort of the lowest social unit cost to the highest. And you can see that we can actually, using this methodology, because well bees as a as a measure of welfare is sort of like capturing most things that are important to us, many more things that, you know, review preferences can capture. And so we, rank, we ranked here essentially a whole range of very different policies from the from lowest social unit cost to sort of like highest. Some have even negative social unit cost, meaning that they save money rather than sort of like cost. So they should always be implemented. But then we have like things, for example, the city of culture in the UK, which has a social unit cost of I think about 1,000 pounds uh, per Welby. So it produces one Welby at 1,000 pounds. So it's kind of all right. But then we have the London Olympics, which produces um, one Welby at, you know, I think 9,000 pounds or something like that. We have um, other things which are action for happiness. I'll talk about this in a second, which is social, which is a local community course, which produces one Welby at a very low cost. So we'd ideally would start implementing here and work our way up and essentially stop where a budget right which could be depending on how much money we have available could be either either we could have a lot of policies passing or we could have very little policies passing but that's sort of like the idea of how the happy planner would go about um you know maximizing well-being in society now let's look at some examples um so these are youth traineeship programs which are largely I have to say, I largely made up by myself, but I think they kind of like give you an idea of how to put this into practice. So this is one youth traineeship program. I think this is the one which is not so much made up, but this is one which actually was really implemented by the Welsh government and which we're also discussing in our book in chapter five. Um, it was a youth traineeship program which, you know, existed between 2015 and 2019, targeted young job seekers aged between 16 and 18, were referred to the program by Career Wales, Careers Wales, it was an intake of around 16,000 trainees until December 2018. Uh, in terms of benefits, it did produce a higher rate of job finding. So there was a 10% increase in job finding, probability of job finding in the first year of the training and 20% afterwards. There were costs, which were 18, around 18, 18 million pounds and also cost savings, mostly from crime cost savings, which were around 1.4 uh, million pounds. Now, we can look at this in terms of um, the tools which we've just discussed. We can look at the benefits per trainee. Uh, first of all, the income benefits, which is £18,000, we simply assume this is sort of like the minimum income that people achieve once they get into like a low paying job. Um, not being unemployed, we know this provides benefits that go beyond, um, you know, the income benefits of having a job, right? We know that, you know, even controlling for income, you know, unemployment is quite detrimental to individuals. Um, and so we want to account for this additional benefit of finding a job. Turns out there's 0 0.46 life satisfaction points on a 0 to 10 scale, so 0 0.46 well bees. Um, their cost per trainee, which are one thousand which are around 1,140, precisely 1,145 pounds, their savings per trainee, 84, 85 pounds, and their one-off cost of implementing this program, which are 100,000 pounds, and the number of trainees are around 16,000. We have here the one Welby monetary value, which is 13,000 pounds, and we have our discount rates here, which is 3.5% financial discount rate, and the well-being discount rate is 1.5 pounds. And the evaluation period is we want to evaluate, uh, sorry, appraise this policy over a period of five years. So this is pretty much arbitrary. I think in UK government, the main uh, policy appraisal period is actually 10 years, at least for um, social interventions for infrastructure can be something like even 32 years. And then after that, actually the discount rate even changes. Now, if you want to put this into our framework of uh, social cost benefit analysis, we have up here in this upper panel, we have benefits, 
In this lower panel, we have uh, net public costs, which are costs minus savings. We have here our discount factors. We have the time periods. We want to look at it. Zero is simply the year in which the policy is uh, conceived. And then we have uh, five more time periods in which we evaluate or praise this policy. We have Welby's per trainee, which is 0 0.46 times the 10% rate of job finding. And here the 20% of job finding. So it's the expected Welby's per uh, trainee, so to say. We can get to the total values by taking these numbers in the first row and multiplying this by the almost 16,000 um, trainees. And then we monetize them by taking this number here times in every time period times 13,000 and then we get this monetized uh, well-being benefits. We also have the income for trainee in pounds, the expected income. So it's, uh, as I said, 10% job, job finding rate times 18,000 uh, pounds minimum income is 20% 20, 20 job finding rate. Again, we get sort of like the monetized income times the amount of trainees. And then we get, again, the total monetized income. And then what we're doing is for the total benefits, we are essentially summing up the total values in pounds plus the total monetized income. And then we get these, this row here. And then we simply have to discount this because we're going back into the future and money in the future doesn't matter so much anymore. We discount every time period by the financial discount factor and then we get the total benefits uh, here, the present value of the benefits. We do it very similar for the costs or the net costs. We have the cost per trainee, they're one off, which are here. We have savings per trainee, which are primarily healthcare cost savings and I think crime cost savings of actually getting people into work rather than having them unemployed, especially young people. And then we get the net costs per trainee, which are simply the costs minus the savings. And then we multiply them times the amount of trainees with this one of 100,000 costs. And then essentially what we're doing is we can again calculate the present value. If we do this, we get the present value of the net public costs. We take, we can calculate in two of our metrics of whether we should go ahead with the policy or not. So net present social value, we get 291 million pounds of net present value of the policy and 18, the benefit cost ratio of 18.53. So if we basically take the benefits, the net present value divided by the net present value of the costs, we get a benefit cost ratio of 18.53. So something actually which is considered a good policy, right? And benefit cost ratios above one are generally good because the benefits are greater than the costs, but 18 is, is considered a considerably good uh, benefit cost ratio. We can do the same calculation in, in the cost effectiveness framework. The only thing, the only difference here is we don't we basically start, essentially nothing changes with the net cost. They're basically exactly the same as before, but for the net benefits, or for the benefits here, we don't convert, uh, we don't convert wellbees into money. The only thing is what we have to do is we have to convert income into, into wellbeing. And then we essentially sum up all the benefits in terms of wellbees. We discount them back. We take a slightly different discount factor here because remember that the well-being discount rate is different from the financial discount rate because the marginal rate marginal utility of income is increasing at a decreasing rate in the future what we're doing here is then we are simply calculating the social unit costs so we're taking the cost divided by the benefits and so we have a social unit cost of 1414 pounds what does this mean well this training ship program um, costs producing one well-be under this traineeship program costs about 1400 pounds um, and now we can compare this with different with a different uh, policy and see this is whether this is sort of like cheaper and producing one way be than um than an alternative policy i do have a different training program i'm just running over this super quickly in terms of like the time this is something which i made completely up um but it's sort of like just to illustrate that you know you know we can actually compare different policies here again we have uh 15 50, individuals this time Young people between 17 and 20 years, they have need status. Assume only that 50% of these people actually take up the, the, the policy, this training program when offered to them. And it lasts actually, it's much more intense. It lasts one day per week for 52 weeks or one, exa exactly one, one year. Um, it also has several active ingredients. So it's a multi component intervention. So it's volunteering in the local community. It's a social emotional skills training uh, on top of that, which is sort of like a mind mindset intervention goal setting and planning techniques, and also you want to teach them uh, job search uh, techniques. We can look at the benefits. So volunteering, we know, has about 
to life satisfaction points uh, benefits to the individual. We assume that this holds only for one year when volunteering actually takes place. So there's immediate adaptation to, uh, to, uh, to this benefit. There's a social emotional st skills training component, um, as we said, so that is increasing life satisfaction by 0 0.1 points uh, from year one to year five. So essentially skills, you know, once trained, once cultivated, we assume that they actually stick. Being employed, again, 0 0.46 life satisfaction points. We assume that people get employed after from year two to year five onwards. And again, we assume that when it's employed, they also have an additional gross income. And this is again, 18,000 pounds from year two to year five. Costs are also much more expensive of this training program. 10,000 pounds per trainee in the first year. So, and then again, we have a one-off implementation cost of the policy, which comes even before year one, which is simply, you know, implementing this policy. Again, we can have put all of this in sort of like our setup slide. We have here the benefits in terms of well-being, well -being points. We know that in the time periods in which they're accruing, and we have also this monetized benefit of 18,000 pounds. We have again, the costs per trainee, 10,000 and the one-off cost of 100,000. Number of trainees, remember, only 50% of those uh, trainees who are being offered the program actually take it up. So it's 25,000 with the monetary value of a value, which is 30,000 pounds. And again, we have our two discount rates, financial is 3.5% and the well-being discount rate is 1.5%. Uh, again, you can have the same cost-benefit analysis here um, as before. We basically sum up all the well benefits uh, per individual we multiply them times the number of individuals, then we multiply them times 13,000 to get at the sort of monetized, monetized well benefits. Same for income, essentially we have income, 18,000 sort of like the minimum attainable income from get when one's getting after, you know, unemployed into like one perhaps low paying job, multiplying it times the number of individuals, um, we get the total benefits in pounds, then we're discounting them uh, and then we're summing them up. For the costs, we actually don't have any sort of like cost savings here. We simply have the cost per trainee. Um, there's no net costs equal to the gross costs uh, because there are no savings multiplied by the number of individuals, which are actually quite a lot here. Uh, so 25,000, we get sort of like the, we discount it back. Uh, and then we have the, the, the one off lumps of cost, lump, some one off implementation costs. We sum everything up and then we get here the, um, the uh, present value of the net public costs. In the benefit cost ratio, it's 9.67. So dividing the benefits times the cost is 9.67, which is worse than the first policy. And also if we basically conduct a cost effectiveness analysis using pretty much the same methodology as before, we get a social unit costs by dividing the net present value of the net uh, public cost divided by the present value of the benefits, uh, we get a social unit cost of 2,957 pounds. So under this policy, you know, generating one way be uh, costs actually 2,957 pounds. So it's actually more expensive to generate well-being under this uh, policy. So both training programs are good value for money, right? And we've seen the benefit cost ratios, they are above around 10 or above 10. That's actually quite good. So uh, 18.53 for the first one and 9.67 for the first, for the second one. Social unit costs are also cheap, essentially compared to other policies. 1,414 pounds for the first policy, but it's more expensive for the for this actually, you know, stronger intervention. Partly because it's more expensive, right? I mean, it's simply more expensive to have this multi-component interventions. So if we want to like look at them together, if we have scarce budget, we uh, want to implement the one first. The first one here would be the one which we want to implement because it simply produces well-being or generates one way be at a, at a cheaper cost. Also, the benefit cost ratio is much higher. Uh, but if we have budget to do both, and particularly if they might serve different populations, right, we want to also implement them, all of them, right, but we want to start with uh, the first one. And that's sort of like how, you know, using well-being data and using well-beings can actually help us sort of making actual policy decisions if we have scarce resources at our disposal. So if we actually do not really we can't really implement everything, right? And just like a last uh, word of caution, of course, in reality, you know, we also look at different things than benefit cost ratios and social unit costs, because there might be other considerations, strategic considerations of ministers and policymakers of what to implement, party programs, and so on and so forth. But of course, you know, an evidence-based, you know, happy planner, so to say, who wants to maximize well in society, given 
a sort of limited budget would of course then apply this methodology because it's simply much more evidence-based and much more rational than uh, other uh, policies. I think I'm sort of like skipping over the exploring what matters course, which is essentially doing the same thing for like a social community intervention, but essentially you get, I, I think you get the gist of how it actually goes. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, actually, it's, it's great uh, timing. I was, I was about to say, uh, time to wrap up. So, uh, everyone, if you would, uh, please raise your virtual hand um, or write in the chat, uh, and we will call on you to, uh, you know, to ask questions. Um, and I think I'll, I'll take the opportunity to get started. Chris, so I wonder if um, you have seen this done yet in any countries, and uh, if there you know, are any uh, particular, let's say, caveats. Um, I, I can see some uh, potential challenges uh, that, uh, you know, different people might raise. Uh, you know, one thing you mentioned at the beginning was that the well-be could be adjusted if you have a, a different ethical framework than utilitarianism. And uh, if you want to weigh, you know, poor, um, let's say, uh, people who are impoverished in multidimensional poverty uh, more. So uh, have you seen any examples of this being used? And, you know, what kind of pushback uh, have you addressed thus far? Yes, so I mean, it's sort of like early stages, I think. Um, so the supplementary guidance on well-being in the UK came out in 2021. So it's sort of like, it's been there. Um, it's sort of like very slowly being adapted. I think this also, it's also interesting to see why this is the case. I think it's partly um, people still being quite unfamiliar with it and people actually like, you know, having established tools and established trainings that sort of like, you know, and, you know, takes time to sort of like, you know, familiarize yourself with a new method. Um, and also, you know, you're quite busy. My, most civil servants are, are quite busy. I've seen it actually done quite a lot by sort of the charitable sector and organizations like State of Life and social enterprises to sort of like try to make the case for you know, public goods and sort of like public initiatives. But it's also being, I think, slowly being sort of taken up by government, but it's actually much slower than sort of like the charitable sector, which is sort of like imitating these methods for also making cases for funding uh, with, say, the Treasury or other organizations of UK government. Um, there are various reasons, as I said, um, so it's actually would be interesting research to look into sort of like policy uh, adoption and sort of what what are the factors why people adopt things and why they don't. Um, pushback in terms of, um, not really pushback, uh, but there's, this con the, the, there's a lot of um, talk about, of course, how we can sort of like look at different people at different, different, um, different parts of the scale, especially those at the lower end of well-being to start off with. And the methodology is um, in terms of, I mean, the well-being, as if you like accept cardinality, is very much, um, you know, fine with using other other social welfare function, but there are, I have not come across any application where this has actually been done. And partly this is also because I guess, at least in the UK, sort of like different social welfare functions are not part of government policy analysis. I mean, it's sort of very contentious, you know, how much weight you should be given to different, different, you know, different, um, you know, people at different parts of the scale and, you know, what kind of social welfare function you should actually adapt. And I think it's in political praxis, practice is quite difficult to come up with a consensus here. And I think this is why most policy, I mean, guidelines here, at least in the UK, are sort of like bypassing this issue and then saying, okay, well, let's look at sort of policies that are directly already targeting more people who are in misery rather than sort of like doing some sort of like um, mechanical weighting. Yeah, that, that last part uh, makes a lot of sense, uh, directly target the people in misery, um, much easier than assumptions. Uh, you have a question here from Maria. So uh, Maria says, uh, willingness to pay and subject well-being are both based on self-reported survey data. Um, so they are prone to the same biases. What is the advantage of subject well-being approach compared to traditional willingness to pay? Uh, in particular, when people get a greater realization of the purpose of subject well-being use? Yes, I mean, in terms of like, I mean, yes, depending on review preferences can be captured via surveys or via administrative data, right? Um, so I think the big difference here is that, you know, we basically ask people themselves how they're doing with their lives, um, as opposed to sort of like looking at, at, at sort of like their behavior and their choices. 
Um, and yes, I mean, for real preference, we also need perfectly functioning markets that are in equilibrium. Um, so that's also like a problem because for many things, there are simply no markets. And so uh, same thing, many things might simply not be captured. And for stated preferences, I think, you know, I mean, there can be like greatly designed discrete choice experiment and contingent valuation studies that also get close to get close to these valuations um, that are true. But I think my belief is that at least economists sort of like don't trust stated preferences that much um, unless they are maybe an environmental economist. And But again, yes, I think that the basic advantage is that we allow people to judge for themselves what matters to them uh, rather than sort of like trying to infer that. I mean, stated preferences probably get closest to that. But then again, most economists don't really trust people you know, who sort of like make ex ante predictions about what's good for them for various reasons. He have revealed, I mean, in terms of like experience preferences or life satisfaction data is sort of, we usually don't, you know, make clear to people what we're interested in. We're simply obtaining their, you know, their well-being from surveys without them necessarily knowing that we try to value something in the surroundings or something in particular. So I guess one important takeaway is that we also need well-designed surveys um, that's true for reveal preferences, but also very much so for, for life satisfaction data. We need to have surveys that are not framed, you know, where people do not necessarily know that we want to like look at a particular relationship. There are also many survey design issues that need to be taken into account. Um, so I think it's not, I mean, it doesn't, and having looked at good survey data, of course, representative and, you know, it's also, also important. So there are, there are issues themselves by itself. Yeah, so you could say, uh, you know, if you say, how much do you value a forest? There's a focusing bias, which which is different than in a life satisfaction survey. When you ask people how happy they are while visiting a forest. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, good example. It, the last part uh, of what she, she's saying, you could also say it's moral hazard. So Bruno Frey and Stutzer have talked about this a lot, that if we uh, have policy goals set to maximize happiness, that people will start uh, misreporting uh, their happiness. However, not necessarily, particularly when they're in the forest or uh, next to an airport where there's a lot of noise. Um, so it, it would be a general issue, but you might have it across groups that are different. So uh, that would be one pushback that I could imagine is, is moral hazard. Um, have you tried to address that or have a response to, to that? I don't think, I mean, personally, I don't think that people like systematically at a population level will start, uh, you know, you know, misreporting the life satisfaction for, for policy purposes. In a way, I mean, policy is already now trying to maximize people's well-being. And um, I don't think, I just don't believe that people will be systematically at a large scale sort of like faking it. I think, you know, if we have like proper proper surveys that are being, I mean, that we are conducting already, in terms of population level samples that are, um, you know, that are sort of, you know, generally asking about life satisfaction amongst many other things. I don't think that that people are necessarily faking that. I mean, I just can't believe it. Yeah, sounds reasonable to me. Um, we do have a, another question, Chris, um, and then uh, Francesco. So, uh, Christopher, do you want to uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, or would you like me to read it out? I'll, I'll wait a second. Okay, um, we have one for Ralph. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it out. So uh, Christopher says, lovely talk and excellent examples. Thanks, I'm wondering about system effects in the calculations. Yes, the individuals get jobs and that's great. And this has well-being benefits for those individuals. But are there additional jobs in the economy as a result of the policy? Um, if not, then their job might uh, be seen as a loss to someone else who now remains unemployed without an income. How would this get accounted for in this assessment? Isn't it important to think carefully about the counterfactual? Yes, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, I have to say these were like super stylized examples, which are also purposely kept very simple. Yes, I mean, it would be great if we could, could see that, you know, whether, you know, this is sort of like negative externalities on other people, or maybe generates even more, you know, might, might contribute to more economic growth and more jobs, so actually a lower bounds of the benefit. I mean, ideally, we want to have all of these things included. At some point, it becomes very, very complex um, and sort of like exceeds my abilities and my spreadsheet. But yes, I think this, this sort of like would be great to include and sort of encourage you to actually do that. And one thing one might 
might think about is sort of like, you know, generating some sort of, you know, micro simulation model that actually does account for sort of wider, wider effects, general equilibrium effects to the market, and then actually, you know, spits out one, one total, uh, way B number that, you know, is across the whole population that can then be ranked in a certain way or simply summed up if you're a utilitarian. But yes, that would be great. Uh, next question is from Francesco. Um, and Francesco, go ahead and unmute yourself and I'll uh, mute myself. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. There was so much to take in in, uh, in a fairly limited amount of time. Uh, my question is a little bit on, a, as far as I understand, a follow-up on the previous question by Chris. Uh, basically, I'm wondering if there can be a conflict between uh, promoting well-being and sustainability using this approach. In other words, uh, can the valuation give priority to policy decisions that benefit well-being, but not necessarily, or you know, eventually hamper uh, social and, uh, and natural resources? Yeah, also very good question. So how do we account for climate change? So ideally we want to account for climate change in the sort of like the stream of well-being of people in the future, right? I mean, if we basically increase the time horizon and we see that one policy which say, creates jobs today via environmental degradation has a positive benefit today to people, but might have a negative well-being benefit, which could also be measured in well-being in the future, that requires us to have some sort of like estimates, right? I mean, how much climate degradation in the future might have, might reduce people's well-being, so that might be kind of tricky. We do have the social cost of carbon, which we could include in the in the net present value, and that uh, in the net present value of the costs, in the net public costs, uh, so that would be one way of accounting for climate change if we know that this policy is sort of like leading to environmental degradation, which might be an easier workaround than having like a longer stream, like looking at the very long time horizon and looking at Sort of people in the future and future generations but that might be theoretically possible might be practically not very feasible but you know we want to ideally i think the, the way to do this now is to like look at the social cost of carbon and include it as a net public cost thank you uh, uh that raises a very interesting point uh the social cost of carbon is coming from different calculation is that correct that's already been done by um the the uk and as an example they already had one of your examples um there was cost of crime uh, as well as income benefits so there's a whole bunch of tools already in place that you're going to not replace with uh life satisfaction benefits but just supplement yeah. is that correct that's correct so we could we, yeah exactly so there are tools for estimating sort of the costs the unit costs uh to the so the government of you know one person being incarcerated or the unit costs of one person needing psychotherapy or the unit costs of you know somebody showing up at a and e and staying in the hospital for a day so these are things that you know these social unit costs are estimated by personal social pss or use personal social service research units they are in the uk but they also exist in other countries right where you basically know exactly what one day of so and so service or services actually costs, and these are estimated. And we take them the net public costs, and they exist already. And we sort of, yeah, we build on them. Great, uh, that's helpful. Um, I, I think this isn't fully replacing what's already existing. This is just supplementing. Um, yeah. So the benefits, the benefits we're looking with Wavies, we're looking at the benefit side, but the net public costs are the sort of the, the costs to government. And they can be either the, the easiest things that are the cost of the policy, but then the more difficult things are sort of like flowbacks. So things like, you know, does the policy down the line sort of create sort of like social you know, savings to the government, you know, um, like education, for example, direct costs now, but as savings to the government in the future because people are less sick, um, are less, are more pro-social um and so on and so forth but might have also further costs down the line if i'm educating somebody now to be you know uh, an a-level graduate this person might be more likely to go to university so there are more you know costs to come so it's this is kind of like really tricky um, right. to actually look at net public costs and they're also not they're also not really published that well mm. right so that's also the same for many interventions right they don't really often don't really publish costs and that's that's some tricky uh, we have a few more questions in the chat. I hope you don't mind uh, staying a, a few more minutes. 
Um, uh, Raul, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Uh, and then we have uh, Gerard, you'll go after Raul. Uh, Raul, would you like to? Hi, Chris. Just, uh, just a question. I, could, I can connect the camera, but uh, congratulations and thanks for the presentation. I just have a question about the, the monetary value of the world B, because it's 13,000 GBP, so that, that's about 40% of uh, of uh, GDP per capita in the UK. Uh, do you think that it's good percentage to extrapolate to other uh, countries if you want to do this kind of analysis in other countries? Um, so the way how we monetize it, I think that's it's sort of like a compromise, I guess. So ideally, we don't want to monetize well-being at all. Why would we? Because we actually want to look at sort of the waiving benefits of our policies. It's sort of like the ultimate sort of net outcome. We, there's no need to put it into money, but if we want to monetize it, I think um, the most palatable way, I think in other countries would be also to like mm, peg it to something which already exists, right? So the quality is being used widely. And so that might be, it has a monetary value for health economics valuation. So that might be the easiest way to peg it on. And sort of the margin rate of substitution, as we did for the upper bond, might be even more tricky because that relies very much on the income coefficient and sort of having a a uh, sort of causal estimate of that, and that's sort of very contested. Thanks. But I think it's doable for other countries, yes. And I think it's and I think it's also being done. So I think in in Denmark at least they're trying to pack the the way be onto the quality. I think in Norway too. Okay, thanks. So we'll have to look at it. <laughs> Uh, Gerard, uh, you're up next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christian, also for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. I was just wondering if you could say a few more words on the uh, discount factor of the, of the well-being and how you take uh, present bias of, of individuals into account relative to the longer term goals of, of governments. Yeah, let me just show you something. I do have actually, I do have actually something here for you. So how we do it in the, can you see this? So how we do it in the UK, so we do have the social discount rate, which essentially is the pure time discount, which is 0.5%, which is simply our preference for the present. Then we do have, uh, in the UK at least, uh, they add something which is called a catastrophic risk premium, which is 1%. So the idea here is that, you know, simply, you know, it might be that tomorrow doesn't exist, or the society we live in tomorrow doesn't exist, so we might want to factor this in, and hence discount a bit more. And then what they're doing is they're essentially adding sort of like the long run economic growth uh, here. And that's that, well, that's what they assume is 2%. And this term here, this long run economic growth term simply falls off in the social discount rate for well-being. Um, and that is sort of like the, the idea of that. I mean, there is not really like a present bias term here, like this beta delta preferences, that you have like a beta here and you sort of like multiply this times this whole term here. Because I think this is sort of like, because we, we as rational government, of course, we are not present biased. Mm -hmm. That's the, the answer. All right, uh, Lucas uh, Leitner, you're up next. I think maybe our last talk. Oh, uh, noisy background. So, okay, I'll ask the question. So uh, he says, thank you for your talk. Um, how could your approach help to evaluate policies which involve a change in the population size. Uh, more people increases the sum of well-bees, but may lower the average of well-bees, or vice versa. This may lead to uh, counterintuitive results regarding migration, family, or health policies. Yes, exactly. So something we're still working on. Um, I think Raul, actually, I should give this question to Raul Sanchez, who's working here and actually looks at sort of like aggregated well-bees uh, across countries. Um, Yes, I mean, this is this is true sort of migration and also births, right? I mean, does it actually increase the fertility rate? Um, so we kind of like try to bypass this problem by looking simply at the current um, at the current uh, population uh, without sort of like assuming that it sort of like grows or dies off and that there is huge migration. But we haven't actually applied it to migration policies, which might be quite interesting because they have an effect on sort of like the migrants, but also the this, the people who are you know already living in the country and then the question is also okay who's the relevant population 
right? Should we look at the migrants before they naturalize and have a voting right? Or should we look at only those people who are like current population and you look at their impacts of migration? Yeah, I think I don't have like a fully fledged answer to that yet, but I'm happy to discuss and talk about uh, possible ways forward here. It means there's a, a research agenda uh, yet ahead for us. Uh, so it means we, uh, that's definitely some. There's definitely refinement. I mean, births, uh, deaths, and migration is definitely interesting. And climate as well, as Francesco said, is definitely interesting. Interesting ways to sort of expand that and how to think about it in the future. So. Well, we're now uh, almost 10 minutes after, um, so I think we'll, we'll close it here. Um, Chris, if you have any last uh, comments for us, uh, you can have the last word. I think it was really interesting. Thank you so much. Actually, really good questions. And thank you so much for having me over. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, it was great to have you and also all of the attendees. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.